Charles, welcome back. I am so happy to be here. I want to compare notes yeah. of advice we've received from mentors or otherwise throughout our lives. Wow. It's about time. Let me uh, offer you some elixir. Oh, that was that's advice worth having. <laughs> elixir, there you beautiful go. mugs, by there the way. There you go. Yeah. In fact, these are uh, handcrafted. Wow. By a big fan of Star Talk. Oh, one Joel Cherico. Cherico uh -huh. pottery. I bet you whatever is in here, it'll taste much better because it's coming out of this. <laughs> <laughs> so, what's happened in your life? Mm. I'm 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 quite sure we didn't receive similar I'm sure we receive different advice because we're from different generations uh not like entire generations but from a different time when I was coming into the field the Hubble Space Telescope was about to be launched uh, right mm -hmm. things were gearing toward a new era a true era of space astronomy and so people were thinking in different ways than they were, say, um, before Back that. in my day. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so so where'd you grow up? I grew up in Ithaca, New York. Ithaca, okay. Yes, uh, where the Cornell University kind of influence was significant at that time. Right. There was a lot of landing when I was a child. Viking landed. The uh, Viking space uh, yes, probe. Uh, that went to Mars and things right. like that. So and a lot of course, of Carl Sagan was a big that's player right, in that. At that time, uh, yes. Exponent. Okay, and, so that's your environment. Yeah, that was my childhood environment. So it's a there. university town. That's right. It's has a university culture. That's right. Okay. That's right. So I grew up in the Bronx. Yes, a different right. kind of Not culture. that the Bronx doesn't have universities, That's but right. I, no one would say the Bronx has a university culture. But I did attend the Bronx High School of Science. Mm -hmm. So get, tell me some early advice people might have given you. Uh, early when did you know you wanted to do the study of the universe? I didn't. I always loved everything. All right. I loved everything. Everything from humanities to the arts to performance to music and, you know, all these in between, musical theater and even science. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I oh, loved I all that science. stuff. Okay. Right. And so and in college, you sang for your I did sing. For the, the Glee Club. Yes. Okay. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, and we traveled the world and we performed and we had little groups and mm -hmm. we sang a cappella as well as were masterworks. You, were you tenor everything or in between. Bass? I was a bass. It's all about that bass. So I always had everything. And so the first piece of advice I got from people is, you got to focus on something. Mm -hmm. Put your energies on the thing that matters. That was crappy advice. And you know what? Wait, did you know it at the time? At the time, I sensed it was crappy advice, but I couldn't articulate it. And I was like, oh yeah, you're right. I, I'm, I'm messed up. I, I'm too Scattered. spread out. I, I'd better focus on something. And then I'd try. And then that was really interesting. And so then I tried something else and that was really interesting. And then everything got all messed up, right? So the lesson that I got from that advice was quite the opposite of the advice that was given. So this is why I would say that what we're talking about right now is not the best advice I ever got. But the advice I got that shaped well, that, no, what we're what after happened. here is things people said that shaped who you became. Right, right. Whether or not it's positive or negative advice. It's taken me decades to understand that this is just the way I am. If I am a person who likes many different things, I should embrace that. If my mind, my brain, my soul, my consciousness is based on bringing everything I see together into a beautiful, chaotic whole, that's how I should live my life. Society doesn't always allow that to happen, right? And that's a challenge that I faced all throughout the rest of my learning. It wasn't until high school that I decided I actually wanted to do science at all. It wasn't until late in college that I decided I wanted to do astronomy. All through that time, even Wait, when so, I was- Wait, so what did you major in? Uh, astronomy and astrophysics and physics. Oh, okay. While I was singing, while mm -hmm. I was performing. No, but, but you did figure out all by college that that would That's be your right. major. That okay. was what the major wound up, I, well, I couldn't decide. I actually wound up, you know, <laughs> putting a bunch of names after my degree. So even in graduate school, um, I very much was at risk of not succeeding in academia because I could not fit easily into a well-focused mold. My advisors- A mold shaped by others who pass judgment on your arc of- 
Yes, uh, and not career. necessarily on me. These are well-meaning, talented, successful people in the field. They were seeing how I was interacting with the field and making an assessment that in order for me to be successful, I got to do this instead of that, right? And so I got that kind of information to me a lot. Uh, one of the things was indeed, you know, if I were to write a letter of reference for you for a postdoctoral position or whatever, I would say- This is someone speaking of you. That's right. Mm -hmm. he, this person was well-meaningly giving me advice. I had probably actually asked uh, this person, you know, for what do you think? And he would say, if I were to write a letter of reference for you for a job application, I would say this guy has loads of talent, but maybe not quite enough focus to do a particular thing really well that you need to as you move forward in society. And this was a very meaningful piece of information for me. And so for decades, I continued to try to focus. And it turns out that I was able, very fortunately, to focus just enough on certain things to make people feel like, okay, you can fit into this, whether you're a, a square or a round peg. My career, my life, Were my you square whole, or were you round? <laughs> I was icosahedral. <laughs> okay. Uh, How many sides does an icosahedral 20. have? 20. Yes, okay, yes, yes. D&D, &D, mm -hmm. percentile dash. You know, you roll D20? You, no, 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 sorry. I'm you sorry. didn't play D&D? I, I, I had friends Dude. in high school. We all should remember, and this is the lesson that I got from these pieces of advice, right? We have to see how the world will receive us, but then we have to know who we are inside to work into that world as true selves, as opposed to squeezing ourselves into those positions that'll make us suffer in our lives. This is a really, really valuable insight. What that's missing is the resolve and the drive to maintain a self-identity in the middle of the forces that would shape you to fit their whole. Resolution and drive are not what I would attribute to myself for that. What I would attribute is luck, support of friends and family, advisors, even those who saw those weaknesses in me, they still supported me who I was. And then the self-confidence to try was produced or was fostered by an environment of people who supported me. I cannot claim any special ambitional power or other kind of, you know, human ambitional. quality. I like that word, uh, ambitional. <laughs> that makes me, you know, better than anybody else in this mm -hmm. succeed. It was just how it turned out, and I was very fortunate that way. You I also imagine... have an extraordinary memory. Oh. It's, it's uncommon. Well, okay, just thank in you. Case Okay. You didn't know that about yourself. <laughs> uh, does this resonate? I mean, your advice that there you received? There are very important overlaps yeah, between yeah. what you describe and my life. So in the Venn diagram, that overlapping portion is important. Yeah. Oh, for those of you who don't know what a Venn diagram is. They know is, what I'm Take a look at the visuals. You'll see. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to do astrophysics since age 11. Well, I knew the universe was calling me since age nine. So this, this goes deep. It goes deep. So, so in that we vary. With, right? with that ambition, I was perennially intrigued by how often people would recommend I do something else. Oh my goodness. Now, wow. keeping in mind, you are Asian. Oh my gosh! <laughs> <laughs> and I am black in America, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. Expectations. No one is explicitly racist, they're just, Oh, we see you, you're in the physics club, but don't you really want to do these sports? Wow. Don't you, won't you be really good at that? Wow. I don't want to equate them mm -hmm. with the hoses and the dogs, yeah. you yeah. know, on, on uh, civil rights protesters. Fundamentally different. Fundamentally different. And yet there, right? I mean, these days we call that microaggressions yeah. or just biases, yeah. right? So it's uh -huh. just, it mm -hmm. was systemic. Yes. And so at every turn, no one was embracing my ambitions. I'm so sorry. And uh, plus I had all these activities outside of school. Mm -hmm. um, like as did you, I had a yeah. very broad interest. So in school, the metric that matters to teachers to judge whether you are gonna be successful is your grades. Mm -hmm. It's not what kind of person you are. It's not what kind of resolve you have. Mm -hmm. It's not what you do outside of school because they don't know that, they don't even care. They just care, what did you get on this exam? I was not their A student. 
I got A's, B's, and C's my whole life. Oh, here's an interesting fact. Okay. I, I was profiled in The New Yorker uh -huh. a few years back. Okay. The good kind of profiling. I said I, I was a B student. Now, The New Yorker has fact checkers. So once an article gets submitted, they call you up. Yeah. They say, uh, were you really a B student? I said, yes. What they didn't tell me was how that was interpreted by the journalist who wrote the article. Oh, my. It was interpreted as, Neil's a mediocre student. Oh, and I thought to myself, oh. what? So there I am, like head of the physics club. I, I bought my own telescope from monies I earned from walking dogs. I built a dark room yeah. in, in my home to print photos. Yeah. <laughs> Whoever the, doesn't know that the, that's there, what that was for. There are astrophotographs you took as a kid uh, yes. that are in your books. Yes. Yeah. And I, I was on expeditions. I was an expedition to Stonehenge, uh, which inspired me to think about Manhattan, Manhattan Hinge. Hinge. Mm -hmm. And so... I'm doing all of this, yeah. and they're saying I'm a mediocre student. So there's there's fact checking, and then there's meaning checking. Mm -hmm. So just to see how I was received, mm -hmm. and the bias that derived from what people saw, that was persistent in my life. Wow. No teacher. Wow. Would have said, "See that guy Tyson? He'll go far." Wow. And one day I'm going to publish my report cards. Okay, <laughs> uh, I have them all back to third grade. Fantastic. Okay. By the way, I was, I was highly social. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Anathema for scientists at the time. What is the ideal student in a class? Yeah. It's someone who shuts up, gets the work done, yep. gets high grades, yep. sits in the front row, yep. and answers teachers' yep. questions. Yep. That person will go far. I wasn't that. So there is no teacher wow. who, at the time, would have said, "Watch him; he'll go far." Wow. And so I have to kind of go far on my own. Yeah, yeah. Right? And so in your case, your personal ambition and commitment was much stronger and much more necessary it, it had than, to be. than it was, my life, it, you know? It was yeah, necessary. Absolutely. Yeah. And there I am on the roof of my apartment building mm -hmm. with my telescope. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. And someone from another high floor of an adjacent building calls the police. Yeah. Because they see me on the rooftop. I don't know if they would have called the police if they saw you on the rooftop. That's right. Maybe still, I don't know, yeah. but they called it on me. Yeah. So it was clear. Oh, by the way, I did do athletics. Yeah. Don't get me wrong. Oh, yes. Okay. I've I seen pictures of you. <laughs> <laughs> I had to ask myself, did I do sports not from any genuine interest from within, but because I was fulfilling the expectations wow. of others? Wow. Where... The visible black people then mm -hmm. in society were either athletes or entertainers. Yep. And that was an important revelation for me. Wow. So I, I had to be mostly self-driven, mm -hmm. and but very important. And this I think you'll resonate with this. You, you need an honest assessment of what your actual abilities are. Yeah. Because if you don't, you're delusionally think you're greater than you are or less than you are. Yes. Going into graduate school and I had attended conferences and I knew what questions I had in the talks that were given and I heard other questions. I said, yeah, I belong here. This is my place. Mm -hmm. These are my people. Yeah. And I'm feeling it. Yeah. And uh, at the time I got my PhD, there were seven at most nine black PhDs ever. Wow in astrophysics mm -hmm. out of at the time two or 3,000. You couldn't measure it by percent, you, it was just raw numbers. So not to play the race card here, but I'm just telling you that I, I had to overcome that. Wow. So what I learned from my father, who was active in the civil rights movement is, uh, when people feel this way about you, they just don't know any better. And why don't you use their hatred or their indifference or use it as, a, as fuel to excel? so that at the end of the day, they have to confront your excellence. Even if they would have ignored it well past a point where they would have paid attention to others, <laughs> it means you actually be, have to be that much better. Wow. And women face this as well. This is Constant. constantly, constantly, constantly. So this is not a unique uh, issue here, right? He, so there are my teachers complaining about my social energy. Wow. Because I'd be passing notes in class. Of and, course. And, one of them says, of course. less social involvement and more academic diligence is in order. <laughs> Exclamation point. When you, then, 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 then I'm hired here yeah. to be director of the planetarium and we're fundraising mm -hmm. and I'm positioned at tables 
where I have to like socialize with potential donors. Absolutely. And I'm thinking, to, to, to your point, mm -hmm. you have this portfolio of all the things that are you, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and in that portfolio was a social element yeah. of me, and I'm in a job that taps that. I don't have any regrets at all for that. And, and I hope... I'm, I'm, I host a podcast that I think <laughs> requires some socialization. So these are things that the teachers would have suppressed. Yeah. And I hope that you will take comfort from the fact that in the intervening years since you and I were in school, there has been a much greater awareness amongst educators. I see more and more students benefiting from teachers who recognize that it's not just the letter grade or the number between zero and four that is your grade point average, that marks your potential, that figures out where you're going to go, that defines you as a learner or as an individual in life. On my uh, verbal SATs, yes. they were kind of, they were average for college bound people, but no one would say, hey, watch him. He's, <laughs> look at that verbal score, watch what he'll, no, none of that, okay? So like, Several years into being director here, I'd already started my column for Natural History magazine. Ah. <laughs> All right, somewhere in there, like th three years in, I got a, a letter in the mail from the Educational Testing Service. They wanted to use your stuff. No, wait, wait, no, wait. wait. So, so these are the purveyors of the yes, SAT. Yes, and yes. I'm reading it just to show what kind of a grip they have on it. It was like, <gasps> did they rescind my scores? Like, what? Just to show what kind of grip they had. Then I said, no, they must know something because it addressed it, Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson. Okay. So I opened it up and said, uh, dear Dr. Tyson, we recently uh, read one of your essays mm -hmm. uh, in that, mm -hmm. and we, we're impressed and we want to use it in the <laughs> verbal part of the SATs. And it was like, you. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> so people trying to get me to not do things that were fundamentally part of who I was, which resonates with your story. You have to, at some point, be who you are yeah. Yeah. and make that work. Yeah, occasionally you have to trim it so it fits in a in a in a place, but if on fitting in the place people see that you're bigger than that trim profile, then they might value everything you can be for filling out that volume. For people who are listening to this conversation between us, trying to glean what advice we might give to them as they pursue their careers or their interests, might it be something along the lines of be who you are use your friends and your knowledge to know who you are and then just forget what anybody else tells you who you are. Is that, is that it? All I know is that every successful person I've ever met has a list of people who said they would not succeed. <laughs> so that tells you there's gotta be a lot of ignoring going on <laughs> of people's assessments of your promise and performance okay. in this world. I live with that. Yeah. Works for me. Yeah. Be, Thank you. Be yourself. All right, we got to end it there. Wow. These are uh, to being yourself. To being oneself on earth and in the universe. Star Talk. Conversations with Charles Liu. Keep looking up.